I do do. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the 60K q and A. I'm gonna be answering your top 20 most requested, upvoted, hearted, liked questions. All right, so the first question, or question number 20, we're gonna be going in reverse order to build tension throughout the video. Helps with the watch time, I've heard. So the first question, at this moment, do you think that rings can be enough to develop your upper body to its full potential? He's been training at home now for two years and he's managed to put on about 10 to 12 kilos of lean mass. Nice work. With just a pull-up bar, dumbbells, and a small barbell. Is it worth to invest in a rack or is my money better spent elsewhere? Side note, I do train my legs, but I don't really care about maxing them out. So if you don't want huge legs, you just want that sort of a toned Hollywood look. You can just go full Kino body and uh, there's no need for a rack. I'm just kidding, Greg. Um, but I would say it depends on your finances. Home gym investments are totally up to you. And this is where if I don't know your budget, it's hard to give advice. But I would say, yeah, rings can do a lot. When it comes to the chesticles, certainly, you know, you have RTO push-ups, you have dips, you have... Um, you know, lots of awesome options here. Flies, you have push-ups, you have flies, you can elevate your feet, you can do them from a deficit. Like there are lots of really, really good options. You can get great range of motion, great stretch, great contraction. I would say they are at least as good as free weights. And I would not have thought this a few months ago, but it's absolutely true. They are a phenomenal investment for the chest. Biceps, also really, really good. Triceps, Eh, you can do overhead extensions. I've been doing those. They're okay, but I would say uh, overall weights are going to be better. Shoulders, all around very, very good. You look at a lot of ring gymnasts, gymnasts, they have incredible shoulder development because a lot of the isometric holds they do are very, very challenging. Often gymnasts will also use weights, but I think you can get a lot of mileage when it comes to rings. Abdominals, also a lot of really, really uh, good options there. Traps, uh, they're okay. Um, not amazing for the upper traps just because you want sort of heavier weights. You can do inverted shrugs, but like kind of meh overall. Spinal erectors, also kind of meh. It's not going to compare to a deadlift or a good morning or even a squat. Um, uh, lats, pretty good overall. So I would say for the most part, yeah, they're a really good option. Um, my ring book is going to have lots of lots of really, really good options for you there. My ring training book will be out in, I don't know, a week or two, just finalizing some pictures and proofreading and, and making sure it is polished. But uh, yeah, I would say overall, really, really good option. And you can definitely get jacked without the gym. All right, next question, kind of a touchy one. The current lockdowns, these seem like hell on earth from all reports I have seen. And then number two, China's lack of support for Ukraine, seeming support of Russia. Well, I did say pretty much anything is fair game. Um, but, uh, so it is certainly tempting and it is my instinct to go on a 15 minute rant, just bitching about the current situation. Uh, but I also have to realize that I live here and that my situation is a lot different than most people. And I have to be a little bit more careful and thus important. I actually did record a 15 minute rant, by the way. Uh, it's just in my best interest <laughs> as an adult to, uh, Maybe delete that and, and not uh, not send that into the Q&A. I think logically it doesn't really make sense from a cost-benefit point of view. Also doesn't really make a lot of sense. The disease is pretty diluted by now and watered down and doesn't, po doesn't pose nearly as much of a threat as it used to do. And so I think harsh lockdowns are probably not the best idea. As for the second part, it's just tactical right? It's not a moral thing. It's just what makes sense from their point of view and being strategic for the future. That's all it is. All right. So the next question, I'm actually kind of surprised that I got that many likes and upvotes because it's kind of specific, but I guess some people resonated with it. So basically, long story short, TLDR, this guy wants to be able to do everything. He wants above average level of muscle, conditioning, stamina, athletic, be healthy, every sort of task in a normal life, uh, run, jump, twist, sprint, grab, carry, throw, whatever, and the highest level of GPP I can to be prepared for anything life throws at me, blah, blah, blah. Well, typically life doesn't throw you that much stuff, okay? So if you want to just like be ready for life, the level that is required is not very high. Anyway, just do CrossFit. Uh, I'm joking, but not 
entirely joking, do a variety of stuff. You know, train like the Bioneer. Basically, don't focus on any one specific task. And I think this is where sometimes uh, content creators or online coaches, they push powerlifting on people or they push bodybuilding on people or they push, you know, whatever system they have on people. But if you want to get good at a variety of stuff and be healthy, you should do a variety of stuff and you should eat well and you should you know, maintain a reasonable body fat percentage. So it sounds like your goals are varied and therefore your training is also going to need to be varied as well. Next question on overhead pressing. You have said that the Klokov press, which is a snatch grip behind the neck press, isn't all that better for side delt development compared to the standard overhead press. So what vertical pressing angle do you consider to be the best for it? And where does the trap bar OHP rank in terms of side delt development? Okay, so first of all, if you want pure side delt development, pressing in general would not be my go-to, okay? You're better off doing uh, a dumbbell lateral raise, a cheat lateral raise, a cable lateral raise, lots of really, really good options here. Um, and I would say that pressing might not be the most efficient way to get to your goal. That being said, if you're gonna press, I would say do whatever is most comfortable. So behind the, the next stuff is often vilified. If you don't have the mobility, yeah, probably not the best option. But if you do, I would say just if you look at the action, yeah, behind the neck is going to be a little bit more side delt um, compared to front delt and compared to triceps as well. So um, I would say try both, incorporate both, see what you prefer, and then go with that. I know it's not a definitive answer, um, but it is going to be individual. As for a trap bar OHP, make sure you set it up in a power rack because if you fail it, you can't exactly like, I mean, it's gonna conk you in the back of the head, not a great idea. That was the plan, not a great plan. But that can be a really good option as well. I've done it a few times, but I haven't done it enough to really give a very strong opinion on it. All right, next question. What to do when having consistent lower back pain after doing conventional deadlifts and squats over a period of time? I've been practicing my form and I would say after filming myself multiple times, it looks like good technique. Congrats on 60K, thank you. So. Sometimes what looks like good form isn't actually good form. And if you're getting pain, I would say that's a pretty decent indicator that it's not actually good form. Or maybe it's just too much loading or it's just too much volume or you're progressing too quickly. But I can't tell you how many times I've had someone say, oh yeah, my squats are perfect. And then they send me a video of their squats and they're just like really not good. And I'm not saying this is the case for you, but it might be, right? Like some people think they have great form and it's actually not good. So uh, I would look at your loading, I would look at your programming, um, I would look at if you're sitting a lot, if you're just you know plopped in a seat all day, that could give you back pain regardless of your training. I would look at your sleep, I would look at your stress. And so yeah, there's a lot of factors that go into lower back pain. Barbell medicine is a really, really good resource here. And you have to realize it's not just mechanical and it's certainly not just what you're doing mechanically in the gym that can cause or not cause lower back pain. It is multifactorial, typically. Next question, congrats on 60K, thank you. You deserve it, but do you use evolving rep ranges? And would you please explain how it works? I watched Natural Hypertrophy's video on it, but still can't seem to grasp how it works, especially how to track my progress accurately. Okay, so it's um, fairly simple. You basically have a rep range, and you go from the bottom of the rep range to the top of the rep range, and then you add weight, which should knock down your reps because it's heavier and you know, with the same performance, you're gonna be getting less reps, fewer reps. Um, and then you rinse and repeat. So basically you, you add reps, then you add weight, then you add reps, then you add weight, then you add reps, then you add weight. That's why it's called double progression. That's another, another term for it. So you're manipulating two variables over time. This is unlike linear progression, uh, where you have just one variable, where you just have a five by five, or I'm sorry, sorry, Fa by fa, and you are adding weight with the same sets and the same reps. You can even have a triple progression where you're manipulating another variable, typically the sets. So you might manipulate the reps, the sets, and the weight. For most people, just double progression is enough. So you add reps, you add weight, you add reps, you add weight, just progress that way. Um, as for how to track your progress accurately, just write it down. You might get like, you know, let's say you're working in the six to eight rep range, you know, the first workout, you might get seven, seven, six, then you get eight, seven, six, then you get eight, eight, seven. Then when you get three by eight, you bump up the weight. 
Now you're down to say 766 or something like that. You could also get a little bit creative with it where maybe not every set is the same weight. So if you know you're gonna fall out of the bottom part of the rep range, maybe the first set you get six reps and you wanna be in the six to eight rep range, especially if you're focused on hypertrophy, you can reduce the weight to keep you in the rep range that you want. If you're more focused on strength, I would say it's maybe better to let the reps fall, but to keep the same weight on the bar because it's more the intensity, the loading, that is gonna be driving progress. But for hypertrophy, you probably want to be in the same rep range. And especially if you're falling below five reps, I would say it makes a little bit more sense to drop the weight and to keep in the rep range that you want. We're making all the noble natties say, Hello YouTube like natural hypertrophy. Can you say it too? Well, I've already said it. In a YouTube. Uh, I don't like the word making. It sounds like I'm being forced to do something against my will, but jokes on you, I actually want to say it as a tribute. So, in a YouTube. All right, next question. Q13 is on sort of wedding warm-ups, so where you're doing higher reps to start a lower body workout. So you're doing like 300 reps of lower body workout in, in 12 to 15 minutes, four sets of 25 on leg curls, on uh, reverse hypers, on this kind of stuff, just to get warmed up and to get blood flow and maybe to get some uh, GPP in. I think this is a good idea. And I think on the whole, you're better off warming up more rather than less. And some people will say, hey, well, this is going to impact my performance. If this impacts your performance, it's a sign that your work capacity and your recovery capacity are low. And therefore, you should be doing it. And you know what? You get used to it. I typically warm up pretty hard. I typically warm up pretty hard. Yeah, baby. You know, whether it's upper body, whether it's lower body, I do a lot of work. 15 reps, 20 reps, 25 reps, 30 reps or more close to failure. And... I know I've said that I'm against pump training. The pump can be useful. It's just that if you focus on the pump to the exclusion of everything else, but if you add it to your workout, either in the beginning to get prepared uh, or at the end as a sort of finisher, I think this can be very beneficial. Uh, John Meadows used to do this in his programming. He would start with more like pumping contraction exercises than he would do the stretching exercises later. So he wouldn't necessarily do bench press first in the workout. It would be later when you're warmed up and you have a lot of blood in the muscle and the risk of um, a muscle tear is almost certainly going to be lower. So I would say, yeah, this is a great idea. If it impacts your performance, it's a sign that you should probably do it more. Next question, what are your thoughts on artificial sweeteners? Should they be avoided? Are certain ones better than others, i.e. stevia instead of sucralose? So I've been asked this quite a bit just in DMs. And I always get the vibe that the answer people want is for me to say, oh, they're fucking dangerous. They'll give you cancer, uh, gut microbiome, blood brain barrier, bitches, that kind of thing. Uh, but if you look at the actual data, not bad. Like they've been tested a lot. A lot of the data that says or suggests that they might be linked to cancer. By the way, the, the word linked often doesn't mean shit. Okay. Linked does not mean causation. It means they are correlated at best. Okay. So I would say generally speaking, they're fine. And if you look at diet sodas, often those can help you lose weight. Um, I'm not going to say they're healthier than water because weight loss and health are two different things. Hmm. Um, but I would say, yeah, you can include these in your diet and it's a lot better than like a full sugar soda. Okay. So this is where the fallacy of the natural is a big thing where people say, well, you know, sugar is natural. Therefore sugar is okay. Artificials. Oh, it's artificial. Fuck. Um, yeah, not a, not a thing. So you can include them in your diet and it's perfectly fine. And just because 50 fucking diet Cokes a day gave a rat cancer, that doesn't mean it's going to give you cancer. And this is often where the media blows things out of proportion. Like there was a recent study on artificial sweeteners um, and like one group had a higher risk of cancer, but they didn't say that, hey, the sugar group and even the fruit juice group, like natural fruit juice, had higher risks of cancer than the artificial sweeteners. So compared to the control, I think there was a slight increase, but compared to what? That's what you always have to think of when it comes to nutrition, compared to what. It's not just what does this do, it's what might this replace in your diet. Uh, Stronger by Science did a really, really good assessment of this like 12 or 13 days ago. I will link that in the description below. I think they nailed it. 
um, and that is a really good resource. Next question, how can I be sure I am progressively overloading properly? Some days I cannot lift as much weight as previous sessions, so I'll try to add reps, sets, or changing tempo. But when adding sets, I worry about entering the junk volume territory. Okay, so if you can't lift as much as the previous session, it could be a few things. First, it could be that you didn't do enough the previous session. That isn't very often, okay? Or it means you did too much the previous session, or it means you just didn't have enough time to recover. So let's say you smash chest Monday, the next day you're probably not gonna be able to repeat the performance, okay? Almost certainly you won't be. Even by Wednesday, you might not be ready, okay? So it's if you, do, if you have a bad performance Wednesday, that doesn't mean you should think, oh, well, I should do more, because I'm not recovered. That that doesn't make sense. You're just digging an even deeper hole. Um, the trouble with adding reps or sets or changing tempo is you're adding in another variable to make up for the fact that you are not better. If you're not better, you have to look at why you are not better. Again, it could be too much, could be too little, could be insufficient recovery, could be diet, could be sleep, could be protein, could be stress, could be a lot of different factors. And I would say assess your program rather than just chucking more variables into the mix. And as for the junk volume, I don't think it's a term that's formally defined in the literature. If you're doing volume that's far in excess of what you can recover from, which might be the case if your performance is being you know, driven downwards, yeah, I would say that's junk. It's not particularly useful. Or it's volume that is actually not being stimulatory. So it's, it's volume, you know, let's say you're doing 10 reps with 30% of your one rep max. And normally you could do 40 or 45 reps with that amount. Just a warm up. That's not doing anything, right? Like that's not anywhere near close enough to failure to actually be effective or useful for hypertrophy. And you're kind of just like burning through glycogen and wasting your time for no good reason. So I would say if it's not sufficiently close to failure or stimulating blood flow or, or helping recovery or doing anything for you, it's junk. All right, next question. What are your favorite exercises for every muscle group? Well, it's only uh, eight words, but big question, my guy. So I would say for hamstrings, I'm gonna have a full video out on this somewhat soon, uh, or maybe it's before this video. I don't, I don't know, we'll see which actually gets done first by the editor, who is me, by the way. So for hamstrings, I would say Romanian deadlifts, back extensions, uh, good mornings are also good, and then any kind of machine hamstring curl. Nordic hamstring curl is also really good as well. For calves, <laughs> quads, I would say hack squats are really good. I've never done them, though, so they're not my favorite. It's just that I hear a lot of good stuff about them. If I had the opportunity to do them, I'm sure I would really like them. It's one of those movements, you, you can just tell that you would fucking like it, right? Um, but, you know, alas, I have no access. I would say high bar squats... Leg presses where your feet are very, very low on the pad. Um, for me, I'm very hip dominant, so I don't have a lot of like really, really good quad movements. You can do hack squats in, in the uh, Smith machine. I've tried those a few times and they're good. Um, front squats, also good, but sometimes the limiting factor is upper back or core strength. Um, yeah, I would say high bar, plat style squats are gonna be best with squat shoes, fairly narrow stance, um, and then elevated heels as well. So I'll, I'll actually have a full video on this as well. For glutes, I would say hip thrust, Bulgarian split squats, lunges with a slow eccentric and like preparing your foot. So you dorsiflex your foot as you're going down and you just prepare for that impact and absorb all that juicy tension with your glutes. Those are really, really good. Um, I've been doing unilateral leg presses. I'll do a full video on those as well. Uh, those are really, really good for the glutes. I've been doing them as a mix of quads and glutes, but if you really want to target only the glutes, you can put your foot a little bit higher. Uh, those are excellent as well. For abs, I don't do a lot of direct ab work. I've been doing a little bit more recently due to this QL issue. Um, side bends are good with the dumbbell. I know they're vilified, but they've always been a good exercise for me. You can also do the QL rehab where you're on a back extension and you're just sort of like going sideways by holding a dumbbell. Uh, those are also good as well. Cable crunches. I've al actually also been liking, you know, really focusing on crunching down with the abdominals and keeping the tension out of the hip flexors. Those are really, really good. Um, hanging leg raises. I suck at. I've been doing them on the rings. Um, they're something that I have to get better at. I would say on the whole, I don't have a very, very strong 
core, nor do I have particularly developed abdominals. So for me, this is definitely a weak point. And I would say I'm not the best resource here anyway. However, triceps, yeah, boy, you know what it's up. Um, I would say overhead extensions. I just did a whole video on these uh, where you're standing, where you're leaning away. Those are really good. And then rope pushdowns, close grip bench press, dips. I would say those five movements have put most of the meat on my triceps. Biceps I've done full videos about as well. I did a top 10 list, which I will link up above. It's over there. I keep forgetting it's reversed now. Um, or was it reversed before? <sighs> Mind blown. Um, uh, incline curls, barbell curls, reverse grip curls, hammer curls. Uh, I don't, I mean, I get a little bit of juice out of, uh, compound movements, you know, T-bar rows, pull-ups, etc., pull-downs. Um, but I would say, yeah, isolations are going to be really, really important if you want to fully develop your upper arms. As for shoulders, overhead movements are a very, very good base to draw from. Just getting stronger to overhead press is a good idea. However, I have also found that isolations are important here as well. So dumbbell lateral raises, cables, I've been using a machine even where you can hold onto the handles and get like constant tension. Those are really, really good. Rear delt work, uh, rear delt raises, skiers, face pulls. The rear delts are super resilient so you can just smash them with a ton of volume beyond failure. At least that's what I found. Um, I don't do a lot of front delt work. Uh, I actually found that rings were really good for front delts just because you're getting a big range of motion uh, and a nice stretch, which a lot of free weight movements don't really provide. For traps, a lot of people neglect the mid traps and lower traps. I find that rowing variations of all kinds are fantastic. So Helms rows, again, typically beyond failure, chest supported rows, machine rows, cable rows, just row, row to grow, go and row to grow, yo. Uh, those are really, really good. As for upper traps, I actually don't do a lot of shrugs. Uh, I used to do a lot of like explosive Olympic style weightlifting, like high pulls or low pulls from the hang. I found that those are really, really good, not just because of the concentric, but also you're getting that sort of like weighted stretch at the bottom. Uh, I've done uh, rack pulls above the knee. I go a little bit lighter than I could and I hold it at the top, really letting, letting the traps sort of stretch downward. I think that's something a lot of people miss. They just stand there. No, you want to, you want to internally rotate and let that shit stretch out the upper traps. So you'll see when I'm deadlifting, I'll put a picture on the screen, my shoulders are low. They're internally rotated and the upper back is rounded and that is what is getting that juicy stretch on the traps. And so um, you want that way to stretch. Farmer's walks are also pretty good. But again, you wanna be, you wanna be in this position where you're actually getting a stretch. If you're like this, you know, you're probably not getting as much. You, you wanna be in the right positions to get the most out of the movements. As for chest, various bench presses, so incline, flat, dumbbells, those are all good. Uh, I do a little bit of cable work, but I, I don't do that much of it because I think that um, this is often overdone. And if you see someone and they spend all their time in the cable stack, usually they're not natural, okay? Naturals seem to do better overall, just observationally, from heavier weights and more just compound movements, just, looking at what people actually do and, and the big naturals that actually get results, uh, a lot of them are just sticking with the basics rather than like trying to... You know, <clears throat> anyway, uh, also machines are good. So I would say a mix of barbells, dumbbells, machines, some compound, some isolation, and just getting stronger over time is going to be what works well for chest. Uh, and then for forearms, uh, I actually find just like holding on to heavy barbells is quite effective. Uh, it's an isometric contraction, yeah, but if you do enough volume with just double overhand deadlifts or, or bent over rows, that kind of stuff, it can be very, very effective. Even like pull-ups, pull-downs, that kind of stuff. Uh, you do want to be working on this muscle as well. I actually find that reverse grip curls, not extensions, just reverse grip curls where you're sort of flexing at the top, maybe have a wider grip where you're really like extending at the top uh, have been very, very effective. Uh, and also being lean, when you're lean, you know, you get all this sort of, definition and stuff. So, you know, if you want, if you're focused on appearance, I would say leanness is certainly helpful for that area. Actually, for any area really, but but especially for the forearms. And for more information about those movements and a whole lot more, hundreds of exercises, you can grab a copy of my book up there. 
Um, I don't have ads on my channel. This is sort of the only way that I monetize my videos. So I appreciate the support. Next question, is your decade of distance running more beneficial to you compared to doing strength training from an earlier age in terms of overall health and fitness? I would say probably. So my resting heart rate is still like 40 to 45. Um, even when I'm bulked up to near 100 kilos, like 217-ish pounds or something, my resting heart rate is still only like 50 or so. And so when I go to get my, my health check every every year for my Chinese visa, the doctor is like, you have sinus bradycardia. And I'm like, uh, yeah, I know. It's because I, I used to run a lot. I've ran probably upwards of 20,000 miles in my life. And so, yeah, I, I probably have an enlarged heart, but it's not the kind of enlarged heart that is dangerous. It's like an athletic heart or something. And so, yeah, I have, you know, higher work capacity and recovery capacity because I have a shitload of capillarization everywhere and just um, a, a higher general work capacity than the average person. So um, I don't even do that much cardio, but I also don't get out of breath, right? Like I could do sets of 20 or 25 on squats or deadlifts, and it's still the muscle that gives out, right? Like uh, it's not cardio for me. So when I do higher reps, cardio is literally never the limiting factor. I remember doing 50 steps of walking lunges in a row with 30 kilo dumbbells in each hand, and that still wasn't limiting of cardio. And so, you know, for some people, whenever they do more than like eight reps, they're like, oh, oh, oh. You know, that's a sign you should probably do cardio. Um, and, you know, it's something that I might have an advantage compared to a lot of people. Now, compared to strength training, it's sort of hard to say which would be better for overall health and fitness. So if I just swapped out that 10 years of distance running, like 15 years old to 25 years old with strength training, I mean, I'd be bigger for sure because I'd have more than twice as long actually doing strength training. Um, so I'd be bigger. I'd, I'd likely be stronger as well. I'd probably be a little bit more beaten up. Um, but yeah, it's sort of hard to say in terms of overall health and fitness because, you know, would I have added some cardio in there um, in order to mitigate that? It's hard to say. Um, tough question. Next one, thoughts on natural hypertrophy's video on strength standards. So I thought it was really, really good. He made a lot of good points. There's two main things. First, it's important to realize that standards are almost always arbitrary. Okay, so if someone says a three plate bench press or a two and a half plate bench press or a four plate squat or something like that, the reason they say that rather than like a 4.23 plate squat, it's because if you did that, people would be like, I can't even put that on the bar. What the fuck are you talking about? So the reason strength standards are almost always like fixed by weight or plate or, you know, uh, an exact number uh, are just because of convenience. You know, no one gets pumped for a 410 bench press. Oh, I finally squat you know, squatted or bench press 4.03 plates. Like, no. Second, it's important to realize that they are very, very general and that it's a bell curve. So when I say like, oh, to get a big chest, you need a, you need a 2.5 or three plate squat. Even in my strength standards for hypertrophy video, I was very clear that it's like, probably, maybe, right? Like some people have a four plate bench and are not that jacked. Okay, especially if you're modifying your technique a lot, you're minimizing the range of motion, you're being extremely technical, cheating, whatever. <laughs> you can maybe lift a weight and your physique doesn't reflect it. On the other hand, if you train with maybe more volume, closer to failure, higher reps, you're not as technical, maybe you could not be as strong on paper and yet be pretty fucking jacked. When I tell people my personal bests for uh, bench squat deadlift, it's roughly 250 350, 450 pounds, uh, people are often like, huh, I thought you'd be way stronger. Well, it's because I train in a certain way and because there is variation. Some people are stronger than they look. Other people are bigger than they are strong. And one part of his video that I really, really resonated with is that he gets questions and DMs from people, I do as well every day, for people who are like, you know, how much do I live to look this way? Or if I look this way, how much should I lift? Or I've been lifting for eight months and I have a, a 63 kilo bench press. Is that good? And, or like assess my program. And so 
YouTubers will usually not respond to your DMs. That's just a straight up fucking fact, okay? Most YouTubers or, you know, bigger social media accounts, they're not going to respond to you, okay? Because especially after a while, it's death by a thousand cuts. And, you know, this is why I can't assess your program. I can't check your technique, okay? It's just... And this is why we give general answers. We're talking to a population and the bigger your channel is, the bigger your reach is, the wider the population that you're talking to and the more generally you have to phrase things. So you have to realize a strength standard doesn't mean you're gonna look a certain way if you hit a certain number. It's just an average. All right, next question, another on cardio. Uh, He's 22, 183 centimeters, six feet. 95 kilos, so around 210 pounds, uh, 15% body fat. So you're about as big as me. You're the same height, slightly heavier, uh, about the same body fat percentage. uh, And he struggles to run 1.5 miles or 2.4 kilometers in under 11 minutes. Would would love to run under 10. So that's that's not bad considering your your weight. Um, You could try to get leaner uh, at 12% body fat you will almost certainly be faster just from carrying around a little bit less fat. As you get closer to 10%, this, I mean, you'll still get faster, but you also might get weaker as well. Um, And so it's sort of a balancing act. And then the training is also going to be a balancing act because if you start doing a ton of cardio, uh, the interference effect is real, especially the more you do. Now, I think it's often overblown and you can certainly uh, increase your cardiovascular and, and work capacity um, by adding in cardio, it's tough to say without knowing what you're doing now. Um, you know, averaging 640 per mile for 1.5 miles, that's that's solid, especially at that weight. Um, so, you know, again, it's tough to say what without knowing what you're doing now. Uh, I would say tempo runs are good, so where you do like 20 or 30 minutes uh, at a moderately hard pace. Intervals might be a good idea as well, so maybe 600 to 800 meter repeats. Uh, at roughly target race pace. So you want to bump up your lactate threshold through the tempo work, and then you want to bump up your VO2 max through the sort of higher intensity stuff. Um, Sprint work might also help, but I would do it on hills just because you have a a little bit lower risk of injury. You could do like 200 to 400 meter hill sprints, not necessarily sprints, but hill intervals. Um, Those are absolutely brutal, but really effective as well. Technique might be a thing. Sometimes you see people run and they're just like, you know, lumbering along. Um, they're overstriding. And so, you know, you could optimize things there. But without seeing a video of you, it's sort of hard to say. All right, next question. To quote the inimitable, cool word, Greg Doucette, the secret to gaining is doing more than you did last time. Okay, more of what? More sets, more weight, more reps, more exercises. Yeah, so this is where like harder than last time it's true some of the time, but like, you know, tell an average powerlifter, just train harder than last time. Like, they're already training hard and they have to actually focus on the fatigue management side of things in a lot of cases and staying fresh and technique. And this is why you use RPE or RAR. It's not just always going harder. Um, I would say double progression is a really, really good way for most people. Dynamic double progression where you're not always using the same weight. Maybe you have a slightly heavier set and then you go back into the rep range by dropping the weight a little bit. Um, That can be a good way. Triple progression, I don't use much, but often I will give either myself or clients the option to auto-regulate the sets. And so this does make progression a little bit more blurry, but if you feel good, you know, maybe you do four sets. If you don't feel as good, maybe you do three sets. If you feel like dog shit, you do two sets. And this can be, I think auto-regulation is something a lot of people do instinctively, um, but some people don't. And if you have, you know, a five by five, well, maybe five by five is not exactly what you should be doing that day to get optimal progress. In general, I prize loading the most. So if you can add weight, fantastic. I prize reps after that. So if you can't add weight, but you add reps, that's also pretty good. And then I prize sets after that. So if you can't add weight, you can't add reps, maybe you can add a set. But I would be careful about adding the sets um, because it's sort of tertiary to the other two. And if if you have the option, adding weight is the best, assuming everything else is equal, then sets, then, or then reps, then sets. Next one, let's talk injuries, specifically lower back tweaks. The consensus is that tweaks are inevitable. I don't know about that, 
but how often is too often? If injury is inevitable, is it worth staying away from movements that have the highest risk of injury, i.e. conventional deadlifts? So I would say they're not inevitable. Um, they might be inevitable if you are a power lifter who is really driving the weights up and working really hard and you know doing a lot of volume on these specific lifts. But for the average person, I wouldn't say they're necessarily inevitable. Um, I would say some form of injury is probably going to happen if you're trying to maximize sports performance or hypertrophy or strength. I don't know anyone who has achieved a high level of those, but has zero tweaks, zero, zero niggles, zero, uh, zero injury issues. And most people have an area that they have to keep an eye on. That might be the lower back, might be the shoulders, might be the hips, might be the knees. For example, I've never had lower back pain. I've had this QL issue, but I've never had any kind of like lower back pain or, um, or non-specific lower back pain. Um, so I would say it's not necessarily inevitable. I'm not saying I never will in the future, like, you know, it might happen. It is very, very, very common. Um, but I would say you should not fully accept that you're always gonna get injured. Next question, are you satisfied with your physique? Like, do you feel that you've made it or will that always be out of reach? So I wouldn't say I'm fully satisfied because if you're fully satisfied with something, it means that you don't really have any motivation to change it. Um, but I still want to gain muscle. I still want to gain size. Um, but I am certainly happy with my physique. But I was also happy with my physique before I started lifting. People always assume like, oh, you must be way happier now or way more confident. Motherfucker, I was confident before. I slayed with the ladies. Even though I was doing even lift, I lifted some skirts. And I think I probably will get to the point where I am satisfied at a certain point where I don't want to get any bigger. Some people don't get that. And, you know, they go down various other paths because they're not actually satisfied or even happy with how they look. And often this is just due to comparing themselves with other people. And I do do this, but I make sure to keep everything in context and to realize that there's a lot of factors when it comes to how you look. All right, next one. How do you think about the relationship between cardiovascular health, hypertrophy, and being lean in terms of programming and finding a sustainable approach to being healthy and looking good? All right, so that's a pretty big question, actually. So in terms of cardiovascular health, um, again, I do have that nice base from running. I think it does help. So this is one thing where staying natural makes it a lot easier, okay? If you're an enhanced lifter, you got to stay on top of all of that. You got to stay on top of your hypertrophy because that's the reason you're taking the drug in the first place. But then you also have to worry about the heart issues and the kidney issues and the liver issues um, and then staying in good health. And that's why like clean eating is a big thing for enhanced lifters. Um, so if you're natural, like you have a lot more wiggle room in these kinds of things, you know, your body weight is going to be a lot more reasonable. Um, I would say as long as you're below around 20% body fat, you're probably okay. Um, and especially if you're below like 16, 17%, uh, I don't think body fat is really going to be a main driver of health or lack of health. In terms of programming, uh, being lean doesn't affect programming that much. Uh, if you're very lean, it might affect the work capacity and, and your ability to recover, uh, especially on some lifts. Um, but I would say I don't necessarily write a program differently if someone is uh, lean or not lean. Um, you just have to take into account someone's individual work and recovery capacities. And often moderation is just the key to this. Like if I want to maximize health and longevity, I would probably be a little bit lighter. So even if you're natural, there's a little bit of a trade-off, but the trade-off is pretty damn small, okay? Like if you're 15% body fat, you have a lot of muscle, uh, and you're active, like your, your, your diet is healthy, your sleep is on point, your stress is on point. Uh, when someone says like, are you worried about longevity? No, not really. I mean, again, if I wanted to optimize that, I would do things a little bit differently, but it wouldn't be hugely different. If you want to optimize looking good, there might be a slight trade-off in health, but again, if you're natural, that trade-off is going to be very, very minimal. And often that health trade-off is just on the enhanced side of things. And I've had people tell me, or at least try to tell me like, oh, 15% body fat is unhealthy compared to 10%. Good luck finding information to support that stance. All right, next question. How has your family immediate and or extended reacted to your overall physique and fitness path? Have you been met with mostly encouragement? 
Do you have siblings or anyone that have asked you for advice on weight loss and lifting? Um, so my wife doesn't seem to care that much. Um, although I did show her a picture of like what I was like before I started lifting. So I've been in China for 10 years, a little over 10 years. I've been lifting seven and a half years or so. And then I met my wife, I should probably know this off the top of my head, four years ago or so. Um, and so she never saw me do you even lift? And so I showed her a picture and she's just like, <laughs> she kind of turned her nose up at it. Um, but at the same time, she's not like, get bigger, motherfucker. <laughs> get bigger, we're getting divorced. No, she's like, I don't think she really cares about that past a certain point. Um, if I get like full on bearded, she doesn't really prefer that. Um, so I'll probably be shaving a little more frequently than before. Um, but I don't, I don't really lift for other people. Um, and like my parents, uh, they don't, they're not like, oh, what's your FFMI? Right. I think if your family cares a lot about your lifting journey, I would find that to be a little bit strange unless they also lift. I think that's something that a lot of lifters need to realize. Most people don't give a shit. Most people don't, they don't really care about like how big your arms are or, or any of this fitness stuff. Um, so if you're not doing it for you, it's a bad reason. Uh, and as for my sibling, yeah, I wrote my brother a custom plan a few months ago. Charged him double price. No, it was, it was for free. Hey, please, the money, it's not good here. And, you know, occasionally he'll ask me for advice. And, you know, friends as well will ask me for advice. Yeah, if you're in the fitness industry, you're probably going to be known as, like, the fitness guy. Or, like, that's, that's your thing, pretty much. All right, last question. What are your long-term thoughts for the channel? It seems like most fitness channels run out of topics two to three years in and either heavily reduce their content or turn into fitness drama channels. Have you considered where you'll take your channel at that point? Uh, I haven't considered it. I don't think that's going to happen for a really long time. I have literally hundreds of ideas already written out um, and hundreds more that I just haven't really completely formulated. For me, the limiting factor is always going to be editing rather than ideas. For every video that I put out, I have like three, four, five ideas that are sort of in the pipeline. Um, plus, I get a lot of requests from people. I have like 3,000 Quora answers, and most of those answers are not particularly repetitive, just because I don't like making answers on the exact same topic. Same thing with video ideas. There might be a little bit of overlap here and there, but for the most part, I am nowhere near out of ideas. And this is part of the reason why I'm taking a more long-term approach. Like I have at least 10 years of content, like actual new content to make. And again, that's not even considering, you know, drama or reaction style of stuff, which is, you know, another few hundred videos and is also ongoing. Um, so I understand why people sometimes run out of ideas. If someone is a powerlifting channel or a strongman channel uh, or a fitness channel where they're comparing, you know, bodybuilder to bodybuilder only, like uh, Mark's Max Muscle, right? Like he has, you know, he just does the comparisons. But even he, there's endless content to make. Whereas I, you know, I'm more of a generalist. So I'm not just squat bench deadlift. I'm not just bodybuilding. I'm not just strongman. Like I'm not just hypertrophy. Shit, I'll talk about anything as long as I'm interested in it. And I think other people can benefit from it as well. So yeah, I have several thousand videos at least left to make. And I'm gonna be making content for the next 30, 40, 50 years, hopefully, fingers crossed. And so I'm not really in any rush to like sell out or to put out two videos a day or to really like push things really, really hard. Uh, I'm taking a more long-term approach because I do have a lot of content planned and a lot of ideas that I still have to make videos on. And just to be brutally honest and transparent with you guys, for me, content creation is never an inspiration issue. It's almost always a motivation issue. So it's more about getting the content done and, and edited and produced and uploaded and thumbnail and timestamps and all that stuff rather than just, oh, I'm out of ideas. Like that is never ever gonna happen because it's never ever the limiting factor. And so when people send me ideas and they're like, waiting for you to make a video on reverse band undulating advanced periodization, I'm like, okay, well, thanks for the idea, but 
you know, I don't need the stress of, of uploading a certain video. Um, and I've even thought about putting, you know, my next 500 video ideas in a community post and being like, hey, which ones are you guys most interested in? But I don't really want that pressure of people expecting me to make certain videos or having a timeline to make certain videos um, just because I don't want that. You know, I don't want the stress of having to create content on a certain time scale. I think burnout among YouTubers is super common, which is why you see people stop making videos. It's not necessarily that they are out of ideas. It's just that the process of content creation, regardless of if it's new or not new, uh, it does take a toll and it does catch up to you. And most of these guys or girls don't talk about burnout because they're not going to get any sympathy anyway and because it's usually not a good look and so they just they just stop making content or they make content less frequently rather than talk about these issues. All right, that is all for this video. Make sure to grab a copy of my book if you like this and you want to support the channel. Uh, like, subscribe, share, all the YouTube stuff that people tell you to do. You don't have to do them, but you know, you can do them if you want to do them. And I will see you in the next video. Peace.